From Pacifica, this is Democracy Now! Hamas has so far sustained a very heavy blow from us. We have yet to achieve our objective, and therefore the operation continues. On the 10th day of Israel's assault on Gaza, five dead Israelis, over 500 dead Palestinians. Nearly 2,500 wounded Palestinians in Gaza. Supplies of food, water, fuel and electricity are running dangerously low, and hospitals are struggling to cope. But Israeli officials say there is no humanitarian crisis. There is no, no shortage of basic needs in Gaza. We take care that medical equipment and food and fuel will arrive to Gaza, even today. We'll get the latest from Gaza and host a debate on the situation. All that and more coming up. Welcome to Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman. Israeli ground troops and tanks have pushed deeper into Gaza and surrounded Gaza City, effectively splitting Gaza into two sections. At least 531 Palestinians have died over the past 10 days, including 80 since Israeli ground forces invaded Gaza Saturday. Over 2,500 Palestinians have been injured. Five Israelis have died since the fighting began. The United States blocked a U.N. security Council statement on Saturday calling for an immediate ceasefire in Gaza. This is U.S. Deputy Ambassador Alejandro Wolf. This council has spoken on many times about the concerns we had about Hamas's military attacks on Israel. The charter of this organization respects the right of every member state to exercise its self defense. And Israel's self defense is not negotiable. The United Nations estimates Israeli forces have now killed at least 100 Palestinian civilians. Earlier today, a Navy shelling off the coast of Gaza killed a Palestinian family of seven inside the Shati refugee camp. Israel says it's not targeting civilians, only seeking to halt rocket fire from Hamas militants. Despite 10 days of attacks, Hamas fighters are continuing to fire rockets into Israel. On Sunday, New York Mayor Mike Bloomberg was touring Sederot, Israel, when he had to be taken into a bomb shelter due to a possible rocket attack. Bloomberg and New York Police Chief Ray Kelly traveled to Israel to express their support for Israel's attack on Gaza. Much of Gaza is without electricity or running water. Hospitals are running on backup generators in order to stay open. A Norwegian doctor named Mads Gilbert said the situation in Gaza is the worst he's ever seen in a conflict zone. He said hospitals in Gaza lack everything, monitors, anesthesia, surgical equipment, heaters and spare parts. Over the weekend, Israel blocked an emergency medical team from the International Committee for the Red Cross from entering Gaza. Israeli officials claim there is no humanitarian crisis in Gaza. Israel, for the last week, has implemented a humanitarian effort alongside the military operation, and over approximately 10,000 tons of humanitarian assistance, food supplies, medical supplies, medication have gone into Gaza through Kerem Shalom. This is part of our ongoing activities in order to try and give the Palestinians some of the, some of the food that they require and the medical supplies. And indeed, the UN has um, acknowledged that they have su enough supplies in the hospitals, and we will continue to do this activity. On Friday, Israeli warplanes blew up the home of Nizarayan, a senior Hamas leader and cleric. The assassination strike also killed his four wives and 11 children. A Palestinian living in the Khan Yunus refugee camp accused Israel of targeting civilians at home. Does anyone evacuate their house that they have been living in for all their life? Why would we evacuate our home? Why are they lying to the civilians? They say that their airstrikes target the militants, but this is lies. They target the children, the house. It's the sleeping people that get air raids. Protests against the Israeli invasion continue around the world. In Israel, 21 members of the group Anarchists Against the Wall were arrested Friday morning after they blocked an Israeli air force base in North Tel Aviv. On Saturday, over 10,000 Israelis attended a rally in Tel Aviv opposing the Israeli invasion. Here in this country, a group of 100 scholars calling themselves California Scholars for Academic Freedom have condemned Israel's bombing of the Islamic University and other educational sites. We'll have more on Gaza after headlines. 
Republicans. In other news, New Mexico Governor Bill Richardson has withdrawn his name to be Commerce Secretary nominee. Richardson cited a federal grand jury investigation into claims that his administration gave out lucrative contracts in exchange for donations to political action committees established by Richardson. The Wall Street Journal reports President-elect Barack Obama and congressional Democrats are crafting a plan to offer about $300 billion of tax cuts to individuals and businesses as part of the new administration's massive stimulus package. The size of the proposed tax cuts is greater than many on both sides of the aisle, and Congress had anticipated. Republicans and business leaders welcomed the idea of basing a bigger proportion of the stimulus plan on tax cuts. Democratic challenger Al Franken has taken a 225-vote lead over Republican incumbent Norm Coleman in the Minnesota Senate race. The state's canvassing board meets today to certify the final result of the race, but Coleman has vowed to challenge the results. Senate Republicans are threatening to block any attempt to seat Franken until the Minnesota Supreme Court rules on whether some absentee ballots were wrongly rejected. In Colorado, Democratic Governor Bill Ritter has named Denver Public Schools Superintendent Michael Bennett to fill Senator Ken Salazar's seat. Salazar is President-elect Barack Obama's nominee to head the Interior Department. Meanwhile, it remains unclear what will happen with the Illinois Senate seat vacated by Barack Obama. Last week, embattled Democratic Governor Rod Blagojevich appointed former Illinois Attorney General Roland Burris. But Senate Majority Leader Harry Harry Reid is threatening to block Burris from taking a seat because of Blagojevich's recent arrest for trying to sell the seat to the highest bidder. The Republicans are pushing for a special election. In Tennessee, new tests have revealed high levels of arsenic in the water near last month's massive coal ash spill. Independent tests found the arsenic level to be as much as 300 times higher than drinking water limits. Two weeks ago, the walls of a retention pond holding the coal ash crumbled. Over 1 billion gallons of toxic coal ash spilled out, covering homes and roads. The Knoxville News Sentinel reports the Tennessee Valley Authority had known about problems in the retention pond for more than two decades, but opted not to pay for long-term solutions to the problem. In Baghdad, a female suicide bomber killed at least 40 people on Sunday in an attack outside one of Iraq's holiest Shiite shrines. The dead included 16 Iranian pilgrims. On Friday, another 23 people died in a suicide bombing inside the home of a tribal leader south of Baghdad. The attacks came just after a new U.S.-Iraq security agreement went into effect. Meanwhile, former U.S.-backed Iraqi Prime Minister Yad Alawi has denounced the policies of President George W. Bush. Alawi said Bush's policies have been an utter failure that gave rise to the sectarian venom that ravaged his country. In news from Mexico, the number of drug-related killings more than doubled in 2008. The country's top prosecutors said more than 5,300 people died last year in drug-related attacks. Over 1,600 people died in the northern border city of Ciudad Juarez alone, a five-fold increase over 2007. The Sri Lankan military has captured the de facto rebel capital, uh, Kilinochichi. The military has also taken over other strongholds of the Tamil Tigers. For 26 years, the rebels have been fighting for a separate homeland in the north and east of the South Asian island. The Cuban government held a ceremony Thursday to mark the 50th anniversary of the Cuban Revolution. On January 1, 1959, U.S.-backed dictator Fulgencio Batista fled the island. Cuban President Raul Castro said the struggle will continue. Hoy la revolución es más fuerte que nunca. Today, the revolution is stronger than ever. It has never ceded a millimeter of its principle in its most difficult moments, not change in the least bit. No cambia en lo más mínimo esa verdad que algunos pocos se cansen it's true that a few have tried and have even renaged its history, forgetting that life is an eternal battle. Es un eterno batallar. The airliner Air Tran has issued an apology to nine members of a Muslim family who were removed from their plane and questioned by the FBI on New Year's Day. Air Tran refused to rebook the family, even after FBI agents said they had done nothing wrong.
The nine passengers were flying from Reagan National Airport in Washington, D.C., to Orlando, Florida. A prominent activist in Austin, Texas, named Brandon Darby, has revealed he worked as an FBI informant in the 18 months leading up to the Republican National Convention. Darby's admitted to wearing recording devices at planning meetings and wearing a transmitter embedded in his belt during the convention. Darby's expected to testify on behalf of the government later this month in the trial of two Texas activists who were arrested at the RNC on charges of making and possessing Molotov cocktails. Darby's role as an FBI informant has shocked the activist community in Austin. Darby's best known as a founder of the New Orleans-based group Common Ground Relief which he helped start after Hurricane Katrina.